morning, everyone. Great to see everyone here. Um, <laughs> uh, good morning. Sorry about that. <laughs> Whenever I hear something weird in my ears, it's different. But um, I don't know. Yeah, thanks for laughing. Uh, <laughs> Uh, let's just go ahead and stand and worship. Lord, we thank you for this time. Lord, we do come together to lift you up, uh, to sing our praises to you, Father. Um, in Jesus' name, amen. This first song that we're doing, uh, it's been a little bit while since we've done it, uh, called Search My Heart. Uh, and I really just encourage you guys to, to really focus in on the words. Um, some of my favorite lines on this is, shine your light and show your face. In my life, Lord, have your way. That's, I encourage you guys to sing along.
together for my good. And you made all things work together for my good. And you made all things work together for my good. You
thank you for your love. We thank you for your goodness to us, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go ahead and greet those around us in Jesus' name. It's always nice to see you visiting with one another and greeting one another, and after you've done so, have a seat, and we'll proceed with our service. This morning, I received a telephone call from Virginia McKay, and Virginia is in South Carolina at the home of her grandson, and there are, is a birthday for a great-grandchild being held this afternoon, and she is in attendance, and isn't that nice that she can still go and visit with family. And so she called to say, number one, she wouldn't be at church, so don't be alarmed if I miss her, which I would be concerned. But number two, to those of you who have signed up for the bus trip <clears throat> to the Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter, I guess actually it's for the Ark Encounter. These are two separate events now down there. Yes, they are related, but they're separate. To those of you who are going on the bus for the Ark Encounter, it will be leaving promptly at 7 a.m. on Monday, October 3rd. So that's one week from tomorrow. It will leave at 7. Don't show up at 5 minutes after 7 and expect it to be here waiting for you to arrive. It will leave promptly at 7 o'clock a.m. for the trip. There are there is a schedule that needs to be followed, and there are appointments that need to be made, restaurant appointments and so on and so forth, uh, restaurant appointments on the trip down. So it will leave 7 a.m. Monday, October the 3rd. Don't be late, okay? And that's her message to you. The offering that we receive today is for the ministry God has given us together here at the chapel. And as our ushers come, I want to thank you for your gift, your tithes and offerings. And I want to remind you that next Sunday is our 40th anniversary Sunday. My friend Carrie Duckett will be here proclaiming God's word to us in one big service at 10 o'clock a.m. There will not be Sunday school. There will be child care for the children but Kerry will be here, and he will be speaking, and we have our one big service at 10 o'clock, followed by a lunch. Plan on that and invite friends to come with you. It's always a special occasion. Shall we pray? Dear Father, as we give our tithes and offerings to you today, it is with the prayer that your blessing will be upon them. We are grateful to be here. We are thankful for the opportunity to worship and to serve, and as we give, an act of love to you, an act of service for our church. Our prayer is that our gifts will be used to touch lives around the world. And this we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for your gift this morning.
You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great. Mary Wilson and Matt Hunsaker, thank you very much, and uh, we appreciate that. I think I got everyone who was singing. I left my bulletin in the pew. There wasn't a third voice up here, was there? Just two, Matt Hunsaker and Mary Wilson. Thank you. I always want to call Mary by her unmarried name, Haywood, and I have to bite my lip every time, and I've done that a couple or three times. I think she's probably used to it by now. All right, it's like Wendy Hobson. I can't tell you how many times. Wendy, whom I've known, of course, since she was a child, the same way with Mary, how many times I've introduced her as Wendy Westfall to people, and she's been married now 10, 15 years, so. All right, enough of that stuff. Our scripture reading today is found from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18. Chapter 18 of Luke, verses 1 through 8. And I'm reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. Will you stand with me, please, for the reading of God's Word? Then he spoke a parable to them, that men always ought to pray and not lose heart, saying, 
There was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. Now there was a widow in that city, and she came to him saying, Get justice for me from my adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward he said within himself, Though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. Then the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said. And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? And I emphasize that, though he bears long with them. I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Keep in mind, as we began the scripture reading, it began with the words, then he spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. Thank you. You may be seated, and may God add his blessing to the reading of his own holy word. It's easy to lose heart when we pray, isn't it? We want people to respond immediately to our requests, and we want the same thing of our Heavenly Father, God. But God doesn't always do that. And that's why Jesus in this parable includes that phrase that I repeated, though he bears long with us. <clears throat> in his own time and in his own way, <clears throat> God answers our prayers. But it is not always immediate, and it's not always the way we want. But he does hear, and he does answer. Just this morning, I was thinking about that thought, that specific thought, and I was praying, and the words of an old gospel song or hymn came to mind, all your anxiety all your care, bring to the mercy seat, leave it there. Never a problem that he cannot bear, never a friend like Jesus. Now there's a gospel song I haven't heard for a long time, and perhaps many of you have never heard it, but it certainly contains a truth, doesn't it? All your anxiety, all your care, bring to the mercy seat, that's the place of God, Bring them to God and leave it there. Never a problem that he cannot bear. Never a friend like Jesus. In Genesis chapter 28, wow, thanks guys. They got it up for me. I didn't have to fool with my remote. Let me make sure it's on. It is. I usually check that before the service, but I got called away. And at any rate, so at any rate, in Genesis chapter 28, we have the story of Jacob. You've heard the story of Jacob's ladder. I see some of you with a look on your face that tells me you haven't heard the story. But Jacob is a man who is destined by God to receive the covenant blessings. That is, God enters into an agreement with Abram. A covenant is an agreement based on trust, whereas a contract is based on suspicion. So God enters into this contract, this uh, covenant, rather, with Abram. And he says, I will give you a land, Canaan. I will give you a posterity or a seed, the nation of Israel. And I will make of you a great blessing to all people. And that comes through the Messiah, the Lord Jesus. And later, of course, when Jesus returns to earth in the millennial reign. So a land, a seed, a blessing. That's the covenant that God makes with Abram. It's often called the Abrahamic covenant. Now, Abraham doesn't live forever. And so the covenant promises are passed on to his son Isaac and to Isaac's son Jacob. But Isaac has two sons, Esau and Jacob. And Jacob is known as a deceiver. 
In fact, his name actually means that. Deceiver, manipulator. And so, God is going to make a covenant with this man, but there must be a change in him. And now Jacob is returning from the far country with his wives and children. And if you recall, his uncle Laban, in fact, deceived him. And so he's coming back with Leah and Rebekah, his wives and their children. And he has a confrontation coming with Esau. And isn't it true that the chickens always come home to roost? And they do. The book of Ecclesiastes puts it this way, cast your bread upon the water and it will return to you after many days. And the picture is that of the ocean or of a lake where you're casting bread out to the seagulls or maybe on a lake to the ducks. And if they don't eat it, after a day or two, it washes up on shore. And the idea is, what you do has repercussions. All of your actions have consequences. And they will return to you. So you want to think through your actions and make sure the consequences are positive. Well, Jacob has had negative actions, and now he's going to face the consequence of having to meet Esau. What he doesn't know is that Esau is a very gracious and forgiving brother, and he's fortunate in that respect. But on his return, he comes to this place that is renamed Bethel, because there God deals with him, and God allows him to know that he must change. And the vision is one of angels ascending and descending on this ladder, meaning that God is going to come down. The Messiah is going to come through Jacob's posterity, through his lineage. And he must understand this, and he must be a person of integrity. And he determines, after having had this dream and this experience with God, that not only will he change, but God will change him, and God does change him and gives him the name Israel, the chosen of God. Now live like it. And from this time forward, he does live like it. God puts a reminder in his body from having wrestled with an angel that he's going to limp the rest of his days. He has a, a hip displacement of some kind. But he changes. God changes him. And this place, Jacob marks out with rocks, stones, a monument, and he renames it Bethel, the house of God. A Bethel. In English, we say Bethel. And there are many churches named that, aren't there? Bethel Church. But it's Bethel. The house of El, the house of God. God has spoken. God has answered prayer. God in this vision has not only told me I must change and become a person of integrity, but God has assured me that my meeting with Esau will be all right and the future is going to be all right because the Messiah is going to come through me and my posterity. And Jesus, the Messiah, does come. From Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob has 12 sons, as you all know, the tribes of Israel and the nation of Israel. Now, it's important for us to understand that Jacob changed the name of this place. It had been known as Luz, and now it's known as Bethel, the house of God. In the Hebrew tradition, and in the Old Testament particularly, names are important. Keep that in mind, that names mean something. And when God changes a person, he frequently changes his name. Jacob becomes Israel. Saul of, Dema of uh, Tarsus becomes the Apostle Paul. 
And so names are important. And Jacob says, no longer is this the place called Luz. Now this is the place of God. God is here. God has appeared to me. God's presence has been known and felt and realized here in this location. So we'll change the name. This is the house of God. Now realizing that names are important, Think about this. We're taking the parable of Jesus and expanding upon it. This parable he taught that men ought always to pray and not give up. And not get discouraged. Even though God takes his time answering, don't get discouraged. Continue to pray, continue to pray, continue to pray. And by the way, I'm not expounding so much on Luke 18, but when Jesus concludes this, He asks, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? What he's really asking is, will he find this kind of faith? The faith that continues to pray. The faith that prays through hard times. The faith that believes God is hearing, and God will answer. Will I find praying faith? Or will people just abandon Jesus must have known, and certainly he did know, what the world would be like when he returns, that we would live in the microwave age, that we would live in the time of instant communication, where if something is happening in a remote part of the world, and if a television camera is there, it will be on CNN or Fox News, and we can watch it instantly while it's happening, which every now and then I... I'm watching some news event, and I have to pause, and my wife's probably heard this a thousand times in our marriage, but I have to say, isn't it amazing? Look, that's happening right now in California or Australia, and we're seeing it. It used to take a month for news to travel from one part of the world to the other. Now we actually see it. Isn't this amazing? And so Jesus understood that this would be a world accustomed to instant answers and instant cooking and instant news information. And so he asks, will I find people with the faith to pray through difficult times, to believe in God, to know that God will hear and answer prayer. Now, the verse that I wanted to bring your attention to, and of course the idea is we want to be those kind of people, right? That's the whole idea behind the sermon today. But the verse I wanted to bring your attention to as we talk about names and the significance of names in the Hebrew culture of the Bible is this. In Isaiah 56, the living God says this. And of course, you'll recognize these words because Jesus repeats them in the Gospels. Isaiah 56, God says, These I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. Isn't it interesting to realize that while God in the book of Isaiah says, my house is to be called a house of prayer, that in the New Testament Gospels, Jesus cleanses the temple with that very quote. I'm driving out the money changers. I'm driving out the sellers of animals for sacrifice. I'm driving them out because primarily this is to be a house of prayer for all nations. And you have made it, to use Jesus' words, a den of iniquity. or a den of thieves. 
Rather than a house of prayer, the temple had become a den of thieves. I think by extension, the Apostle Paul in the book of Ephesians chapter 2 says, our churches are to be houses of prayer. Listen to these words from Ephesians 2, verses 21 and 22, where the Apostle writes, in Jesus, the whole building, he's talking about the church, our church, the churches in Alliance, the churches in Hartville, Atwater, Louisville, Akron, Canton, Youngstown, around the world. The churches are a building being joined together. And on a smaller scale, that's what God was trying to do here with us. We must cooperate with the Spirit of God, of course. That's why the Bible tells us, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. And do not quench the Holy Spirit. We are not robots. God wants us to be sensitive to his will and obedient to his will, but he has not made us as robots. We do have a will. We can grieve the Holy Spirit. We can quench the Holy Spirit. We don't want to do that. But God's work, the work of the Holy Spirit in the church today, is that we are being joined together, and, ri- and uh, we're supposed to rise, I'm paraphrasing a little bit so it fits the English language, and rise to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in Him, that's in Christ, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by His Spirit. Notice the choice of words. We are being built as a holy temple in the Lord. We are called to be people of prayer. First and foremost, people of faithful prayer. Jesus believed in prayer. We'll come to this specific prayer in a moment. But throughout the Gospels, we find him frequently retreating for the purpose of prayer. To such an extent that on two separate occasions, his disciples ask him, Lord, teach us to pray. And he does so. Teach us to pray. We've observed you. We've seen you pray. We know how you pray. We know that you frequently retreat for prayer. We know who you are. We're not quite sure why you find it necessary to pray, but Jesus in his humanity, of course, needed to pray and displayed that. And the disciples picked up on that. They said, boy, if Jesus prays so often then certainly we need to do it as well. So we ask the question, and I propose to answer it this morning in the few minutes we have left, does prayer really make a difference? Does it? And if it does, then why are we so frequently not given to prayer? If it does make a difference, then friends, and I include myself in the statement, let's be people of prayer. A recent Gallup poll indicates that four-fifths of Americans, that's 80%, pray regularly. And this was done across the board. 80% of Americans pray regularly. The Gallup poll went on to survey hospital patients who replied that 50% of hospital patients want their doctors to pray with them. Not for them, but with them. That their surgery and treatment will be successful. We know that in Matthew chapter 26, verse 39, Jesus prays this prayer. Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. This was a very emotional prayer. 
This was a prayer given in a moment of crisis in the Garden of Gethsemane. This was a prayer that called out from Jesus such depth of emotion and anguish that the Gospel of Luke says he even sweat drops of blood. It was an agonizing prayer. It was a life and death prayer. It was the kind of prayer we really don't want to pray, but sometimes find ourselves having to pray. But it is also a demonstrative prayer. It demonstrates for us what prayer is all about. So let's take these words from Jesus and look at three simple points. First, it gives us, prayer gives us possibility if it is possible. By the way, I just got a little bit ahead of myself. You notice that there are three phrases, oh my father. And uh, oh speaks of the urgency of the prayer. My speaks of the personal aspect of the prayer and father speaks of the family aspect of the prayer. But now notice the possibility. Prayer brings possibilities into our lives. What is possible as a result of prayer? Well, a lot of things. The opportunity to retreat from others and to call upon God. The opportunity to gain wisdom from God and from His Word. The possibility, even as I've already shared this morning, as you're praying and thinking ahead to the events of the day, and as I was thinking ahead to the sermon and introductory remarks to the sermon, uh, remembering the lyrics to an old gospel song from years ago that I haven't heard for years, but that seemed to fit in perfectly to what I'm trying to present to you. But here is the primary thing that we see in Jesus, the possibility of a deeper and fuller relationship with the living God. So we gain wisdom from prayer. We gain understanding about life's events from prayer. We call upon past experiences of learning as we pray and as the Holy Spirit brings them to mind and as our memories click in. And maybe our memories wouldn't click in without the assistance of the Holy Spirit. But primarily we see that prayer is not so much a religious exercise as it is a relationship. Oh, my Father. The possibility of prayer first is that it brings us into God's very presence. And we have the opportunity to cultivate a relationship with the living, great God of heaven. Wow. Think about that. Most of us, I would think, in looking across the audience, have made a commitment of faith to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's a good thing. We know that our souls are saved. We know that the Holy Spirit indwells us. We know that heaven is our home. We know that God is with us in this journey of life. But have we taken the time to cultivate a close relationship with God? Last night in our Saturday night service, <laughs> I happened to make the comment that People you want to get to know better, you usually go to and speak with, don't you? Oh, I'd really like to know that person over there. But I'm not going to go speak to him or her. Well, why not? If you really want to get to know that person, go over and introduce yourself. Ask a few preliminary and easy to answer questions like, are you from the area? Are you just visiting? How long have you lived in this area? Oh, I was born here and raised here. Oh, wonderful. And so on. Do you really want to know God? Then approach Him. Speak to Him. Pray to Him. Develop that relationship. Prayer creates an I 
an intimacy between you and God that can be deep, vital, and abiding. Remember when Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount said, don't worry about little things. In fact, don't worry about anything. God feeds the sparrows, and he cares more about you than he does the birds of the air. God takes care of the lilies of the field, and he cares a whole lot more about you than he does the lilies of the field. So don't worry about stuff. With those words from the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus reminds us that God wants to be engaged in our lives. He wants you to know him and love him, and he wants to love you in return. The great New York Yankee baseball catcher Yogi Berra <laughs> was known for his malapropisms, putting his foot in his mouth, saying the wrong thing at the right time. But in one instance that was not a malapropism, Yogi was in a World Series game against the old Brooklyn Dodgers, and one of the batters from the Dodgers came up and in the dust on home plate made the sign of a cross <laughs> and took his position in the batter's box. And Yogi called time out and got up and asked the umpire to wipe the plate clean. And the umpire complied with the request. And as he was brushing the plate clean, Yogi turned to the batter and he said, why don't we just leave God out of the game? Let's let him watch the game from the stands. Well, that's a humorous remark and appropriate, I suppose, for a baseball game, but inappropriate for us as Christians. God doesn't want to watch us from the stands. He wants to be engaged in our lives, and we engage the living God in our lives through prayer. That's how we grow a relationship with God. Secondly of all, Jesus says, if it is possible, there's possibility in prayer, wisdom, learning, relationship. If it is possible, let this cup pass from me. We know that this cup, the death on the cross, did not pass from him. And so while Jesus did not express disappointment with the answer that he got to his prayer, sometimes we do. Disappointment in prayer can be very real. We expect God to march to our tune. But God has to teach us that we must march to his. Prayer is not intended to make God do what we want. Prayer is intended to teach us to conform to the will of God for our lives. And sometimes... That's hard to do. We want something different from what God wants. But prayer teaches us that God is all wise and he is always good. And his will is best for us. In his book, Disappointment with God, Philip Yancey talks about this. And he uses the example of a man named Richard. Richard's last name was not given. And I suppose that his first name is different from the one used in the book. But the book is Disappointment with God by Philip Yancey. And in it, he talks about Richard. Richard, as a college student, was invited to attend a Christian campus organization by a lovely young lady whom he admired. And so he went. And over the course of a few weeks, he came to learn what it meant to become a Christ follower, and he accepted Jesus into his life, or so he thought. He continued with the campus organization and even got to the point where he was teaching Bible studies. And people told him, Richard, you're a gifted teacher. You should consider going into the ministry and becoming a pastor. Upon his graduation, he enrolled in seminary thinking that he would, in fact, pursue that career, that he would learn God's Word and then spend the rest of his days teaching it to people. While in seminary, he started running short of funds, and so he prayed that God would send him money to pay his bills. Money didn't come. 
his girlfriend dropped him and left him for someone else. And he became so chagrined that he began a prayer one night saying, God, I'm going to give you 30 minutes to show me that you exist and you care about me. And if I don't see some sign from heaven in the next 30 minutes, then I quit. Well, 30 minutes came and went, and nothing happened. And so Richard dropped his Bible on the floor and walked out of the dorm room, walked down to the dean's office, and left the school, the seminary. Disappointment with God. The purpose of prayer is to conform our hearts and our wills and our lives to God's will, not the other way around. Jesus prayed one way, and the answer came in a different direction. So don't be surprised if the same thing happens for you. But keep in mind that God's will is always best. Third point, and finally, the ultimate purpose of prayer. Jesus says, if it is possible, let this come pass from me. But then it goes on, he says, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. The purpose of prayer is that God's will be done. God's will is revealed to us in God's word. Either specifically, such as in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, or in the principles of God's word, such as, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who considered, him not, considered himself not to be above others, but humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So it's either very explicit or the principle is very explicit. We can know God's word, and we can know, therefore, God's will. Prayer. gives us possibilities that we otherwise would not have. Wisdom, learning, relationship. Prayer can be disappointing. Remember that God makes no mistakes. Prayer, the purpose that we might conform to God's will and know him better and walk in his love as well as his light. I want to leave you with a thought and then an illustration. The illustration is fresh. Here's the thought. The desire to please God pleases God. Cultivate a desire to please God. You might fail from time to time. I might fail from time to time. But cultivate a desire to please God because the desire to please God pleases God. And his blessing is assured then. On Friday afternoon, we conducted a memorial service for a seven-month-old child. The family may be here in this service. I know they'll be in the second service. But I don't think they'll mind. The child's father asked to give what we call the eulogy, the primary sermon at a memorial service. And of course, I agreed to that. He asked me to share a few remarks, which I did from God's Word. But in the midst of that presentation, he said this. He said, many people have come to us with great kindness and love and concern and expressed themselves with the phrase, I'm sorry for your loss. He said, we mean no offense to anybody present. But when something is lost, it means you don't know where it is. We know where our daughter is. She's not lost. She's in the arms of Jesus. She's in the presence of Jesus today. And as I sat there, right there, and heard him share that, I thought, what a marvelous word of faith 
to present to the Christian body at the chapel in Marlboro. God makes no mistakes. Pray, cultivate his presence, and find yourself a person of faith. When the Son of Man returns, will he find such faith on the earth? I certainly hope he finds it in us. Shall we pray? And as we go to prayer this morning, perhaps there are friends here who have not made a commitment of faith to the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. We would not want to close the service without an opportunity being given you to invite Christ into your life. Following the benediction, there will be at the front of our worship center Rick and Sherry Wallam and Rick and Linda Grissom. And they are here to speak with you and pray with you as other folks file out to go to a Sunday school class or to the parking lot to their car. If there is a need in your life, you come forward and speak with them. If you have a burden in your life and you request prayer, let them pray for you. If you have questions about the church and what it takes to become a member, let them answer those questions. But let them minister to you. Dear Father, today we are grateful to open our Bibles and to see where Jesus encourages us to pray and not to quit praying. Even when it seems like there is no answer or our prayers don't get above the ceiling, we know that God hears and in His time will answer. May we cultivate our relationship with You. May we gain Your wisdom. May Your Holy Spirit move in our hearts and our minds to teach us how to live and how to relate to others. But most of all, may we become people of faith. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit rest and abide upon us all till our Savior come and evermore. Amen. God bless you.